Absolutely. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Hello, everybody. I made this, uh, made this interview 20 minutes and one second long so we could fit in four ads. All right, perfect. Um, that's a YouTube joke. You, if you're a YouTuber, you got it. Um, okay, let's start off with, with YouTube music. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, it's one of the major products that YouTube has, has announced um, that are kind of, were informed sort of by the way people started to use the platform, right? So what's the current state of YouTube music and how's it going to compete with like Apple Music and Spotify for its share of that market, that music listener market? Yeah, sure. So I think as everybody knows, uh, music has been a core part of YouTube really since the days of uh, the founding of the product when the product was first created. Uh, lots and lots of users come to YouTube to discover new music, to listen to their favorite music. That's always been part of the history of, of, of YouTube. And a few years ago, we, we basically decided from a product standpoint to really lean into that and figure out ways that we could actually serve that music lover on our platform. And it started um, uh, with the idea of, uh, well, what if we actually had a subscription service that was built for music lovers on, on YouTube. And we started with something called Music Key that you, some of you may remember four or five years ago that was a service built on sort of the core app. And what we learned from that is two things. One is um, the mode that users are in when they're listening to, to uh, music on YouTube is often different. It's lean back. It's you know, maybe oftentimes driven more by the audio than the video, although the video is an important part of it. Uh, and then also, Music lovers on YouTube also love the rest of YouTube. And so that's where we designed uh, our uh, YouTube premium subscription service, which is uh, a music uh, subscription service, but also brings the best of YouTube with things like background, no ads, offline play. Mm -hmm. And um, really, the reason why music lovers come to YouTube is for a few reasons. One is the catalog. Of course, it has everything that other platforms might have, but, the, but then it goes much deeper into um, uh, live tracks or, or B-side uh, uh, B tracks, et cetera, and all kinds of And like depth. artist access is part of it, right? Because you can have the Artists. same, like catalog is almost achieving parity between a lot of services. But then the depth of our catalog, of what we have on YouTube is just uh, dramatically deeper and really it's something that music lovers have told us over and over is what they truly appreciate about the YouTube platform. And then it's our job to really help them discover that in a way that's effortless, easy, where they're listening to their favorite music and artists, uh, but then also discovering new music along the way. And oh, by the way, something that we think is sort of truly unique to the YouTube platform, given our, our heritage of connecting creators with fans, is a way to actually connect music lovers with their favorite artists, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what are you, uh, you're doing some, some new playlists on YouTube. What's, what's that? Yeah, so uh, you know, our, our YouTube Music app has been out now for a couple years. We've launched the YouTube Premium service and the app in now 71 different countries. And as, we're, as we've rolled it out, we've gotten lots of feedback from our users about what they'd love to see. And one of the things that they tell us repeatedly is they love the fact that, um, uh, and through a combination of things like machine learning and, and uh, you know, human beings that are music lovers, we put all this great music in front of our users in the YouTube Music app. And um, so what we're announcing today are basically three new ways to, for, uh, for users on the music app to enjoy and discover new music. Uh, so we're introducing new um, um, uh, uh, playlists on the platform. One is going to be uh, what, we are, what we're calling the Discover Mix, which is a way to take uh, um, your personalized preferences, what you listen to, use that as a seed, and help you discover new music on the platform. And it uses historical like viewing data, listening data? It uses, well. uses all the listening data on the YouTube Music app, as well as yours on the main app of YouTube. Uh, we have another uh, mix that's going to be called New Releases Mix, which is a way to discover uh, every, day, every week there's new music drop, primarily on Fridays. Uh, so it's a way to uh, discover new music that we think that you will enjoy based, again, on your historical preferences. And then sort of... Uh, really sort of making it uh, effortless when you uh, really want YouTube to just basically play music that we know that you're going to like, uh, help you discover some new music and artists along the way, but really focusing on what you truly love is something called Your Mix. So Discover Mix, New Releases Mix, and Your Mix are three new ways in the YouTube Music app directly on the home screen uh, that users will be able to uh, enjoy 
music on YouTube. So you're fleshing out this product. When is it going to replace Play Music as like the default listening experience for, for users? Yeah, so for those of you um, that may not know, we, we merged uh, the YouTube Music uh, product and engineering teams and the Google Play Music engineering teams about a couple of years ago. And back then, we said that we were going to combine the best of those products into a single product called YouTube Music. And, um, and uh, we're well along the way in that journey. As I said, YouTube Music is now available in 71 different countries. We're going to continue to roll it out throughout, uh, throughout the world. And, uh, but we're going to um, only sort of cut over completely to YouTube Music when we know that we've satisfied all the use cases that many of our users loved about the old uh, Google Play Music, things like being able to support your locker of music, being able to mm -hmm. play music and play uh, audio files on Android devices, uh, and be able to bring over all that work that you did in terms of your favorite playlist, et cetera, from Google Play Music to the YouTube Music app. And so those are kind of the three core uh, features, if you will, that we want to make sure that we support as first-class citizens in the YouTube Music app before we make that cut over. So no exact timeline yet on that? We're going to be driven really by making sure that we address these use cases. And okay. we'd like to do it in the near future, but that's, um, we want to make sure that we nail that for all of uh, Google Play Music user lovers, uh, music lovers, before we, before we make that cut. OK, cool. Um, all right, so let's shift gears a little bit and start talking about some of the other content on YouTube um, created by uh, you know vast array of different creators. So one interesting uh, development recently is L Lily Singh debuted her talk show on YouTube and on uh, network TV at the same time. Uh, and so uh, how, is that, how did that deal come together? Yeah, I mean, so uh, Lily Singh has been an um, uh, uh, incredibly successful YouTube uh, creator on our platform for many years. Her story is an amazing one where we, she just basically um, started to tell stories about her own life um, in a you know, very sort of humorous, uh, down-to-earth way. And then um, it, very clearly her authenticity and kind of put her putting herself out there came through as it does for all successful YouTubers. That's kind of a core ingredient of what makes uh, a successful creator on YouTube. And she did that. She built a following of millions. Uh, and, um, and obviously became very popular on YouTube and kind of throughout sort of mainstream sort of uh, uh, media culture as a result. And um, uh, when they were looking for a replacement of a um, uh, uh, host for that late night show, it made sense um, in a couple of ways. One is Lily just has this natural way of connecting with audiences that just is, is very clearly apparent. You spend five minutes watching any of her content and you see that. But also because um, you know the nature of a lot of that um, uh, a lot of that late night content in particular is that it's often viewed uh, not sort of when it's linearly being broadcast on those channels, but the next day or the next morning in sliced up chunks on YouTube. So right. uh, lots of those late That's night how I hosts, watch SNL, like Jimmy Fallon, yeah. SNL, etc., are great examples of where their YouTube channels are where they get broad distribution and consumption and where their fans can interact, comment on the videos, et cetera. And so that sort of aspect combined with her just authentic connection with fans was the reason why I think yeah. um, you know, she was such a natural choice for this. And, and as so, you all know, she kicked that off two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. And it, was, it, it looks like it's a hit already. Um, so that, those big YouTubers, the people that gain some popularity and traction and build out a robust audience on YouTube, how do you stop them from just jumping ship to network or doing something? What, what are you offering them that's better for them? So I'd say a few things, and I spend a lot of my time talking to, these, to, to YouTube creators, and, you know, and, and every time I've talked to Lily herself, uh, her example, I think, is, is actually is something that carries across to other top YouTubers like her, which is she knows that her core audience, her most engaged fans, her most passionate fans uh, are on YouTube. She tell, she's told me that repeatedly. She tells us that repeatedly. Even the, think about even the way that she launched her late night show. She first broke it on YouTube because she knows that's where her fans are, her most authentic fans are. She's obviously going to continue to build on that core fan base um, with her new show and all of, her, all of the other projects. But whether it's a creator like her or other creators, um, who might go on to things like writing a book or 
or um, you founding know, a makeup company in Hollywood, or yeah. yeah, founding a makeup company. We have creators who um, have um, you know found kitchenware companies, etc. They know that the essence of what they do is the content that they produce on YouTube, and that connectivity that they have between what they're doing and their fan base on YouTube. And they tell us repeatedly that that's ultimately their home. And so it's never about them sort of going on and doing something new and sort of leaving YouTube behind. It's about how do they enhance what they're doing on YouTube with some of those uh, opportunities that come about because of their incredible success on platforms like, uh, like YouTube. OK, cool. Uh, I mean, let's, let, let's talk a little bit about, uh, it, we'll start it off with the, the creator discussion in that vein. Let's talk a little bit about the way that YouTube uses uh, machine learning um, and human curation. Uh, but first, in this, this one way, with many creators, I think one of the big cries or big fears is being demonetized, right? So they say they publish something on, the, on their channel, uh, it violates a policy or an algorithm decides, hey, you know, we really can't sell this to advertisers. Um, explain how that breaks down to me, and maybe I'm misinterpreting it. It's like, what causes a YouTuber to be dis demonetized, and is there a way you can be more transparent with them? Yeah, um, so, you know, one of, the, one of the things that's great about YouTube, and frankly, I think is the magic of an open platform like YouTube, is it's a place where anybody with a creative idea or a story to tell can create a video and upload it and share it with the world. That's been the case since the founding. Um, of YouTube and remain sort of the magic behind why uh, YouTube creators have enjoyed the success that they have. So that's, that's a core piece, and we would never want that to change. Um, having said that, we've always had a set of community guidelines that govern the type of content that is allowed on the platform versus not. So, you know, things like um, hate speech and harassment and, you know, graphic violence, et cetera, have always. They've never had a place on YouTube, and we want to be crystal clear about that, and we try to be as transparent as possible about those policies. Um, in addition to that, we also have something, in addition to our community guidelines, we have something called our advertiser-friendly guidelines. Again, that's something that we publish. We try to be as transparent about for both creators as well as for advertisers that are, that are running media campaigns on YouTube. And that's, those are the set of rules that govern what type of content is eligible for monetization versus not. And so, um, but we want to make sure that we're doing this in a way that's as stable as possible for our creators, is as transparent as possible. So we try to publish those rules. We also have an appeals mechanism so that when creators believe that a video um, was wrongly uh, demonetized, they can appeal that decision. There's an SLA turnaround time in terms of processing that appeal. And we're actually testing out a new program which is um, uh, based on the premise that creators themselves are the ones who know best what's in their content. So it's a self-certification program where creators can actually tell us what's in the video, whether there might be swear words in the video, whether there might be some controversial content in it. They can tell us that ahead of time, and we will use that in a way where we trust the creators. And of course, you know, there's audits, and, and if, if, if somebody sort of violates that trust, then then it's hard for them to be part of this program. But we want to we wanna move more to that type of a model because we think that that will be transparent and stable for our creators, but also make it so that advertisers know, um, uh, you know where, where their ads are running, that they're comfortable with that mm -hmm. um, uh, as well. But one of the things you know, that advertisers and brands really love about YouTube is the fact that it is different than other places where they run, whether that's you know, television or what have you. Because, again, because of this authenticity of creators and the reason why engagement is so high from users on our platform and, you know, the thing that advertisers love more than anything is this engagement is because of the nature of content. Sometimes that content can be edgy, but it's always authentic and it always is something that represents a connection between uh, creators, creators like Lily Singh or who, uh, whoever, um, and uh, their, their fans. Um, so let's let's break down. I would love to get from you a window, kind of into the process of how you like build algorithms and human curation a bit to to take care of content on YouTube. So um, one of the things that uh, kind of the stories that just came out recently is that YouTube channels, Nerd City, and YouTube Analyze, they published a list of what they claimed were trigger words that would get you demonetized flat out, like 
gay or lesbian or a host of other words. And I know YouTube responded to this, and they said there's no such list of words, and the videos were improperly caught up in an algorithmic dragnet. So could you break down for us how the algorithmic detection and policy enforcement works and kind of how you come to those decisions internally? Yeah, so, um, you know, I'll, I'll sort of give a general answer um, in terms of how this works from just a broad product philosophy standpoint uh, on a platform like YouTube. And the short answer is it's a combination of both of those things. And so we have, um, uh, so, you know, just to give you a sense of the scale, uh, about 500 hours of content is uploaded to YouTube every single minute of every single day. So uh, the corpus is, is enormous, and the scale at which we have to enforce our policies, our community guidelines, or our advertiser-friendly guidelines uh, is, is quite large. And so we have to use uh, you know, machine learning al algorithms, classifiers that can enqueue content that might be either policy violative or may or may not be um, uh, suitable for advertisers. Uh, but then we also oftentimes combine that uh, with uh, human reviews. So we announced a couple years ago that we were going to scale up to 10,000 human raters of this type of content. Uh, and just to give you sort of a concrete example, um, you know, machines are good at potentially finding potential candidates of content that might be violating a policy. Let's say it's you know, our violent extremism policy. So they can maybe identify videos that depict graphic violence that might seem like, you know, videos that, you know, let's say a terrorist organization puts up trying to recruit uh, people, mm -hmm. but only humans can make the nuanced decisions in terms of whether that video, in fact, is actually doing that or not. And, or maybe um, it's like an activist saying, hey, this is a bad thing, we should watch out for this. Exactly, talking, what is the context of the it? video, et cetera. And so that's the means by which we use a combination of machine learning and humans. And, you know, we, we, we try to be as transparent about the results of this as possible. Uh, for example, in, you know, our most recent transparency report, which was in Q2 of this year, uh, we said we took down 9 million videos. It sounds like a lot. It's a very tiny fraction of less than 1% of the engagement on the platform. But over 80% of those videos we were able to remove through a combination of machines and humans without any external user actually seeing those videos. And so that for us is a real success story, which is protecting our user ecosystem while maintaining sort of the magic of this, uh, of an open platform. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, one of the features I think that has become sort of like a, a crux of discussion about this topic, about you know, how YouTube uh, does its best to, to kind of guide people towards good and supportable content and how away from content that's potentially like hateful or whatever is is the watch next right so you like watch next is a very powerful tool that allows people to kind of s skate through topics i know i've used it to like skate through like how to topics or uh topics about a particular obsession of mine at that moment whether it's you know model airplanes or shoes or whatever uh, and it works out really great in those instances but sometimes it can run in you into a thing where you fall into kind of like a rabbit hole of content that gets sort of worse and worse is, are, are you thinking hard about how to kind of prevent that and pull people out of that nosedive if they get into areas of content where you're like, hey, we're about to flag this video. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing that I would say is, is and, and your examples illustrate this, which is the vast, vast majority of consumption on the platform are those topics that you love, uh, you know, helping people discover new topics, you know, things like, you know, your favorite Latin music artist or K-pop artist or Afrobeat artist. Um, you know, creators, like I said, of Lily Singh or uh, another creator who actually joined me on stage when I was at VidCon earlier this year, Molly Burke, who happens to be blind but is an inspiration to, you know, uh, young women and, and girls all across the world. Like, those types of stories are what the magic of YouTube is about. Uh, but, you know, back to your question, and that's what's discovered and often, you know, what users are consuming in their Watch Next feeds. Uh, when we go and look at this much more closely, we see users, you know, lots of users um, are recommended content that you would call sort of more mainstream. Sometimes it's, you know, in the other direction. So every user's journey is different. Uh, and um, one thing that we want to avoid is uh, sending users down paths to more and more extreme content, especially when that content might, might not be quite policy violative, so it still exists on our platform 
but is borderline in nature, or maybe it's spreading, you know, harmful misinformation in some way or the other. Right. And so we've had a very concerted effort. We announced this actually back in January, where we are actively trying to reduce uh, recommendations of that type of content in people's watch next feeds, in their home feeds, uh, etc. And um, it's a, uh, it's really. Um, changes and improvements that we're making to our recommendation algorithms. We've actually had over 20 of those changes since we announced this back in January. And as a result, there's been a 50% reduction in user exposure to content that we would deem to be in that bucket of sort of borderline or maybe harmful misinformation. And we're going to continue down that path. So that, re you know, that content sort of represents sort of a needle in a haystack, sort of back to this point that I made of like a fraction of 1% of content, mm -hmm. but we're going to continue to sort of improve our recommendation algorithms so that we can drive that as close as possible to zero for our users as we, as we possibly can. Thanks. And uh, I mean, I'm, I, as a heavy user of the platform, I'd appreciate it, so thank you. Um, the last question I have is uh, there's a lot of people in the audience building sub-content. Uh, subscription content, YouTube is one of the people that has actually had some success in that arena. So if there was a, a piece of advice you could give them, aka us, who launched a sub-product <laughs> several months ago, what, would, what advice would you give us? Yeah, I mean, I'd say, I'd say a few things. And, and uh, as I mentioned early, at the beginning of the conversation, uh, our, our core subscription product is called YouTube Premium, uh, which is made for music lovers, but sort of brings the best of YouTube uh, background, ads-free, offline. Um, and we've had that in the market now for a couple of years. We actually have another subscription product called YouTube TV, which is meant to be a replacement for cable. It's sort of like television uh, done the way that we'd want television to be done. And my sort of, I'd say, two key learnings for me from a, from a product development standpoint around both those subscription products. The first is really, really focus on being crystal clear and as simple as possible about what the user value proposition is. What are they getting when they're paying, when they're actually paying you, you know, 12 bucks a month or uh, whatever they're ending, ending up paying you for, that, for whatever your subscription product is that you're building? Try to be as clear and crisp about that as possible. That's point number one. It sounds obvious, but it's where I think you should spend the most time about being able to articulate that value proposition very clearly. So really think about that. And then the second thing that I'll say, which is I think a little less obvious, is a lot of what matters, especially in the early days as you're trying to build up that ramp to growth of subscribers, is um, uh, are all the blocking and tackling type issues around how you optimize that funnel of acquisition, retention, churn management. How are you actually measuring and monitoring how much churn there is in the first week, the first month? And then how do, when does it actually start to stabilize it? Is it after the second week or the second month? So really understanding your customer acquisition funnel, not just from a cost of acquisition standpoint, but really how you manage that funnel and how, you, how well you understand the leakiness of that funnel. Are, do you support all the FOPs that you need to support if you're a global product and you want to be in all the markets of the world? Do you support... Um, uh, um, how do you actually handle the cancellation flow? How do you remind users that are already subscribed of the value proposition of your product? All of these sort of sort of blocking and tackling and maybe not so sexy things in terms of product development really do come into play uh, in terms of really getting your subscription business off to a not nice start. But those are secondary after really making sure you nail that core value proposition. Excellent. Thanks. I'm sure somebody took notes. I'll, I'll review those later. All right. Thank you very Great. much, Neil. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.